Hello, everyone, and welcome back. I apologize for the lisp in my voice. I have an appliance cemented to the roof of my mouth, and it is still very challenging to say certain words even after a couple of weeks. Hopefully you'll all forgive me. <laughs> Today, we will be going over how I access mandibular incisors. For those of you who missed the video earlier the last month, I review the history of access design. We will conclude that lecture this month with a talk to the residents on a tooth-by-tooth -tooth process for how I access teeth. I will do my best to put out accompanying videos for each tooth, but today I will discuss mandibular incisors. Why did I start with these teeth? Um, because I had two of them come through my schedule today and I remembered to record the process. <laughs> the first image you will see here is a more traditional lower incisor access cavity. The reason that she was in my chair was because her tooth was failing and she had some pain. If you look at the comb beam, you can see why. There does appear to be an asymmetry consistent with an untreated lingual canal. Now, when you look at the access, you can see that the original dentist almost perforated the buckle of this tooth. This is how we were all trained to access incisors in dental school and how a lot of schools still teach students. You take a burr, either a round burr or in this image, a diamond, and you access straight through the cingulum, picking up the canal along the way and most likely missing the lingual. Let's look at why that's a problem. Here's the other mandibular incisor I saw today. Notice that the long access to the canal goes straight through the incisal edge. You should access this by going straight through the incisal edge then. <laughs> Ideally with a small skinny burr, this one was an EG3. So that's what it looks like and how long it takes. Literally it is very quick. We'll watch the full video here in a few minutes. So why did we learn to do cingulum accesses in the first place? Number one, composites used to be ugly. They did not look aesthetic whatsoever. You wanted to avoid putting them anywhere in the aesthetic zone. The other thing to remember is composites are a recent invention in dentistry. Before the late 60s, maybe early 70s, amalgam was the only option. So if you wanted to access a tooth, say in the 40s or 50s, you wanted to keep the amalgam away from the incisal edge as it will show through and stain. Because this was the only option back in the day, this is how dental schools taught access design. It was better to access through the cingulum because, more than likely, an amalgam would be the restoration on top of this tooth. The problem is, and I've been having many discussions online and arguments about this, <laughs> I found many dentists only want to learn in school. Once they get out, they never want to learn anything again. This also happens in endodontics, way more than it should. If you haven't watched that last video on access design, I highly recommend going through some of the fun things that have been happening in endodontics over the previous 40 years, many of which have been made worse by treating what you learn in school as a dogmatic gospel that cannot be wrong. With that said, let's go through the rest of the process of accessing this tooth. Well, you've all seen this part. <laughs> uh, EG3 through the incisal access, pretty straightforward. That's it for the access. So it, literally, it took me that long to drill through and drop down. Now, this case was a little bit easier because the coronal aspect of the pulp was much higher. So pretty easy to get that and drop right in. If it's a calcified case, that's where we start to run into a little bit more of the complexities. What I'm doing here is just using a 2006. This was a wider case. I'll show the x-ray over this so you can remember what it looked like. But it was a wider case to begin with. So the shape of the 2006 is kind of the natural shape of the case to begin with. This tooth had a history of trauma to it. I'm also going to be doing some internal bleaching and a few other things to it. So I'm going to be using calcium hydroxide in or pro or between the appointments to make sure we get all that nastiness out of there. Um, so I'm not going to be using the gel wave on this one. Pretty straightforward as far as this case. And this is all uncut. The few movements you see here and there are just to stabilize the footage. But this is how long it takes. It took about maybe two, three minutes to do this whole case, which is very nice. When they're easy, they are really easy. That being said, most of them are not easy whatsoever. <laughs> so getting the length here. Um, you've seen this 100,000 times, 20.5 or 20, I forgot what it was, but you know, right around there. And we're going to go ahead and take the files down on this one. So 2006, and you'll notice I took the stopper off because I believe it was 20, um, almost there. Yeah, there's already 20.5. So I realized I could just look up what the actual length is. I'll, I'll put it in a text box over here. <laughs> and that's it. That's my cleaning and shaping. That's it for pretty much the treatment on this tooth. At this point, I'm going to finish rinsing with the Triton just to make sure we clean it as best as possible before putting the calcium hydroxide in there. And then we'll be seeing the patient back in a month and finishing up the tooth. When it comes to lower incisor accesses, it is important just to remember to keep things as tiny as possible. These are not large teeth to begin with. If you go in with a large round burr, 
you're going to destroy most of the tooth structure. These are not good teeth to get crowns on. They're okay teeth for veneers, but even then, these are not the teeth that you're going to be wanting to send back to the general dentist with the instructions, hey, mow this down into a prep because it's going to be a toothpick by the time most of these teeth are done. So really not a great option. Once again, I do apologize for the lisping. I, it's actually gotten a lot better <laughs> than it has that has been over the past few uh, few weeks. But she has diabetes. You guys always rip on me for having diabetes. But I can definitely hear myself as I'm recording this in my headphones with a decent lisp. <laughs> anyway, drying it out here, you can see there's still a little bit of bubbliness, whether that's from the infection or from the triton, not sure. But it's enough that I, I was, with all my trauma cases, I always use calcium hydroxide. The predictability is just so nice. The risk of resorption is higher in these cases. The risk of failure is sometimes higher, but the resorption is primarily why I'm doing it. Um, and oftentimes I'm going to need to be seeing them back anyway, multiple times for bleaching, uh, as I will in this case here. It was just about half a shade, um, nothing too intense. This patient, I'm not sure if I said this in the intro, this is a different day. Sorry, behind the scenes. Um, <laughs> uh, the, this patient is a assistant at a referring office. So she is definitely going to want to have it, you know, look, look as good as possible here. So, uh, calcium hydroxide, a little bit of cavit, and we'll call it a day. So that's pretty much how the treatment goes. Um, I just wanted to go through kind of the final keys here for anterior accessing. So the first thing we want to remember is keep it small. I'm using the EG3. If I'm having to look for things, I'm going to be using like an 012, uh, just as small as possible. So that's only 1.2 millimeters. The EG3 is like, gosh, like 0.5. It's so tiny. Um, I've actually had to get separate posts specifically for accesses like these because they're so stinking small. I'm, I use the four tenths of a millimeter alternate posts for those. Next thing is make sure just with all of our accesses, you have a comb beam, use it. It's like you get to do the tooth before you actually do the tooth. When we actually go through the process and talk to the residents, you're going to hear me say that a lot. <laughs> it is very important to use the comb beam to plan out your access to make sure you know exactly what you're getting into. Almost always, the straight line access is going to be through the incisal edge. If the tooth has a crown, there are a couple different techniques we can use. I'll talk about those in a future video, but there are ways you can drill through the incisal edge with a crown. I temporize it if I need to in composite rather than cabot, so it's not visible. It's This is one of those cases where on a maxillary anterior, I'm not going to necessarily access through the incisal edge if it has a nice restoration on it, but on a retreat of a lower incisor, it's so important to find that lingual canal, and it's next to impossible to find without the help of going through the incisal edge that I will access through the incisal edge on crowns for those two. If it's calcified, aim towards the lingual. Most of the time, these teeth are tilted pretty far to the buckley, more than you would think. And so if you're going to perforate, it's going to be out the buckle. It's not going to be out the lingual. So try almost to perforate the lingual. Don't, but <laughs> try. <laughs> if you're a general dentist, don't do these. These teeth suck. They are incredibly complicated to do. The microscope makes this a lot easier. It's just a waste of your, I mean, and for anteriors, you guys get what, 400 bucks? I mean, it, it's just a waste of your time and money. They suck. These are the... First molars, first maxillary molars and lower incisors, I think, are the two worst teeth for general dentists to do. Complete waste of your time. Um, maxillary premolars, maxillary anteriors, great teeth. Mandibular molars, another good tooth as long as you know that there's often a second um, distal canal. But otherwise, don't do these teeth. They're, they're, they're awful. Uh, seriously, don't, just don't do them. <laughs> anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. Once again, sorry for the lisp. Um, I have no idea how much longer this is going to be on there. I do need to make a video going over my post-op stuff and talking about all that. But I appreciate all of you so much, and I will talk to you all next time.